Good morning, Boise New Hope family. I hope this message finds you all well. Hope you've had a great week. We want to continue our conversation today about the disciples of Jesus. Last week, we talked about three of his disciples. We talked about Simon the Zealot, Bartholomew, also known as Nathaniel, and we also talked about James, the son of Alphaeus. We decided that in the end, because these three men spent their time with Jesus, he changed their lives. He had an impact on their lives because these three men were also leaders in the early church in the book of Acts and beyond. Um, so they were they were significantly changed because they spent time with Jesus. This week, we want to continue our alphabetical look at the disciples. We want to talk about James, the son of Zebedee, the brother of John. So I'm going to start with Mark chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. And it says this, it says, When he, being Jesus, when he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. So James and John are sitting there working on the nets. Jesus comes up and says, hey, come follow me. And they do. They drop their nets and they come follow Jesus. In the book of Matthew, when he gives this account of James and John, it sounds like they just left their father by himself in the boat. But here we see that no, uh, Zebedee, their father, was not by himself. He had other hired men with him which I'm sure that at that point in time, the hired men started to talk and chat. And who is this Jesus? Who are these? Who is this person that called James and John just to follow him? They dropped everything and left. I'm sure that conversation was starting to happen. And they started talking about James and John and the fact that they left their father to follow Jesus. Um, so we can learn a few things about James and John. In Mark chapter 3, Jesus gave these brothers uh, the name, the Sons of Thunder, um, uh, so that tells a little bit about their temperament, their personality. They were probably boisterous, loud, maybe a little bit um, impulsive. But if we look at Luke chapter 9, verses 51 to 56, um, we can see a little bit more about their character. In Luke 9, 51 to 56. So this is after or just before the triumphal entry into Jesus, into Jerusalem. Um, but it's after the transfiguration, which we'll not mention here in a few minutes. Um, so here we have James and John, and they're talking. It says Luke 9, starting in verse uh, 51. It says, At the time, I'm sorry, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely, resolutely set out for Jerusalem. He sent his messengers on ahead, and they went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him, because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us called to call down fire from heaven and destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they went to another village. And so these guys were eager to see justice serve um, on behalf of Jesus. Um, they were indignant because this village had rejected Jesus. They were offended on the Lord's behalf. Um, and they wanted to have retribution on this village for that. Call down fire and destroy the village for rejecting the Lord. But Jesus rebukes them. So basically he says, I have not come to kill men, I have come to save them. And so he's trying to put these men in a place to help them understand just what exactly um, Jesus coming to save them looks like. And so I know I do that sometimes. I get indignant when someone else offends me or does something offensive that I think they should know better to do. Um, I have this bad habit of having to make things right. And sometimes I end up making nothing right or often making things worse. Um, James did that here for Jesus. He wanted to make it right and rebuke the town um, because they'd rejected Jesus. But sometimes our behavior, our desire to make things right just makes things worse. Um, and so if we ever want to rebuke someone for their behavior... Just think of James and John. Think of, oh, that behavior is offensive. Well, they may not know Jesus the way you and I know Jesus. So they have no cause to be held to that standard. The Samaritans didn't recognize that Jesus was the Messiah here. Yet James and John wanted to hold them to that same standard. And that can be a hard lesson for us to learn sometimes, that just because we have truth doesn't mean somebody else has truth or understands or accepts the truth. And so we have to remember to have some grace there in realizing that their conviction is not our conviction, and our conviction is not their conviction. It's the job of the Holy Spirit to change hearts and change lives, not our job to correct the behavior we don't like. 
And so James and Jonah don't have to fight this battle for Jesus with this Samaritan village. God can do that just fine on his own. He doesn't need us to interfere with that. I think that's what Jesus is trying to tell James and John here. Basically that, look, I've come for all men, and you don't have a right to destroy that because they reject me. And so he's trying to set them at ease a little bit and also to calm them down. So also looking back to chat to Mark, let's look at chapter 10 there. And we'll look at verses 35 to 45, Mark chapter 10. And so last we just talked about James and John and how they wanted to destroy that village. This is a time a little before that happened. It says here in Mark chapter 10, verse 35, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus replied. And they said, let one of us sit at your right hand, the other sit on your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am being baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right and my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those whom have been prepared. When the ten heard this, the other ten disciples heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. And Jesus called them all together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So here James and John are asking for a place of honor in Jesus' kingdom. Um, yet in verse 41, we read that the disciples, the other ones, felt indignant and offended because they made this request of Jesus. Maybe they were just offended that they didn't think of it first. I don't know. Um, but Jesus puts everyone in their place by telling them that the greatest among you must be servant of all. Um, and so really it's one of those things that Jesus is again trying to put these men in their place not to let their their pride or their ego or their boisterousness get ahead of them Um, they had to drink that same cup Jesus was drinking meaning his sufferings and his obedience to God the Father Um, and so really James and John were saying yeah we can do that we can do that we still want to be at your right hand but Jesus said even still you can be obedient to me but it's not my place to grant those seats of honor your job is to be obedient and serve others. So, James and I gives a little bit of insight into their character a little bit in James and John. And we're talking about James specifically here. Um, but if you look at other passages, James, John, and the disciple Peter as well kind of made up Jesus' inner circle. These are three disciples that were with Jesus and saw special sides of his glory and who he was. In Matthew 17, he takes these three men with him up on the mount when the transfiguration appeared happens and Jesus' face is shown, shining with the glory of God. In Mark chapter 5, again, these three men come with Jesus when he raises Jerry's daughter. Remember, Jerry's daughter was sick and dying, and then all the people in the house thought she was dead, and Jesus says, no, no, I'll take care of her. And these three men, James, John, and Peter, got to witness this, this miracle here. And even in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus is praying that this cup would pass, yet not my will, but thy will be done, Father, these three men went beyond the other disciples to keep watch over Jesus. So these three men, James, John, and Peter, were Jesus' special relationship with these folks. They were his inner circle. They were his people. They were his buddies, his close friends. Um, they got to watch some of the most intimate times of Jesus' ministry. And when he can serve here on this earth, from revealing his glory on the mountain to watching his anguish um, over his fate in the garden, they had a best seat in the house to see Jesus at work and learn from his teachings. And so that's who James is. He was this disciple who saw firsthand, front row, shoulder to shoulder with Simon and John, what Jesus could do and who he was. So um, aside from Judas Iscariot, uh, James, the son of Zebedee, is the only other disciple that Scripture mentions his death. Um, The others are all just tradition or historically, um, but the in Acts chapter 12, it mentions the death of James, the son of Zebedee. Um, scholars typically agree, not always, but usually agree that that death of James, the disciple, was around 44 AD, or roughly 10 to 15 years after Jesus' ministry. So if you think about the early church after the resurrection, the ascension, 
in the day of Pentecost, the church continued to grow and it was kind of headquartered in Jerusalem. And James and Peter and other disciples were kind of the core of that leadership of the early church. Yet here in chapter 12 of Acts, we have Herod Agrippa trying to appease the Jewish leaders, um, not from any solidarity, but simply for, I think, maintaining control of the people. Um, and he has James here put to death by the sword, it says, and he arrests Peter. Now we could ask that question here in chapter 12, why did God spare Peter and not James? We don't know the answer to that question. Uh, but I think often that's how life is. We don't know the full ramifications of what God is doing. And we won't know that until after we get the chance to sit with God and ask him those questions. But it appears that James was the first of the apostles, these 12 disciples, um, that was actually martyred for his faith uh, by Herod Agrippa in Acts here. So to recap a little bit, James, son of Zebedee, was one of Jesus' inner circle. He was one of those that saw Jesus at his most revealing moments. But James also had some flaws. He had some pride. He had some stubbornness. He maybe had some anger challenges there as he's trying to call down fire in this town. Um, you know, so he could have been impulsive or maybe we'd call him a hothead these days. Um, but still, he was one of Jesus' closest friends. In spite of those flaws, in spite of those those actions, <clears throat> he was still one of Jesus' closest friends. Um, and even beyond, up to his death um, in about 44 AD, James continued to follow Jesus, just as he was called to back in the beginning. When Jesus said, come follow me, and he left his boat, and left his nets, left his father, James followed Jesus. And James continued to follow Jesus all through that time. And that's why he was a leader of that early church. And so I think that's the big thing we can learn from James the disciple here is we can continue to follow Jesus in spite of our flaws, in spite of our challenges, in spite of our circumstances or our pride. We can continue to follow Jesus day in, day out, and be close to him just as James was. Jesus, we thank you for this morning and this time together. Lord, help us to continue to follow you each day. God, let us not be hung up on those flaws in our character or our sins, but Lord, let us look each day for your grace and how we can serve you better and know you better. Lord, we love you. We thank you for all you do in our lives. And it's your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. Appreciate that. Um, next week, we'll talk about James's brother, John, the son of Zebedee. So we'll flip the other side here of the sons of Zebedee. We'll talk John. And we'll have a lot to say about John, the disciple here. Uh, but thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate that. Remember that you are loved and you are blessed. And we just thank you for being a part of this church.